it's interesting to to see how it's kind of like being a captain of a large ship. Business of Architecture, episode 381. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm talking to Paul Farrow of Form 4 Architecture. Paul founded Form 4 alongside Robert Gianni in 1998. Uh, And Robert Gianni was actually the CEO when the company began. And for more than 21 years, Gianni had guided the firm with the co-founders, Ferro, John Marks, and James Teffend. And over the pandemic period, Robert Gianni retired and Paul Ferro stepped into the CEO role. Uh, and it's a very interesting conversation I have with Paul because we talk about his previous experience being the chief financial and operating officer in the company. Uh, we talk a bit about his background and how the company was formed. And we look at a number of different things from pivoting inside of the uh, pandemic. We talk about different di- the, you know, the importance of diversification of uh, project typologies and how to address stalled projects. So it's a very useful conversation. I think Paul really went to a lot of depth here and there's a lot of really good golden nuggets of information. So sit back, relax and enjoy Paul Farrow. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Paul, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, absolute pleasure to have you on the show and thank you for being so uh, up, so bright and early. I know it's (laughs) very early in San Francisco where you are. Um, And I think you've had a really interesting career. You're the CEO, founder of Form 4 architecture based in uh, San Francisco. The work that you guys have participated in over the last 22 years is is quite eclectic. You've got a, a kind of specialism, if you like, or you've done a lot of work, certainly in the workplace, workplace interiors, um, and moving into civic and institutional work, um, and, and kind of a portfolio that many would be envious of. And I, I suppose the first question really is, well, what does Form 4 mean? The, you mean the name? Yeah. Oh, so um, there are originally four partners that started the firm. So Form, you know, was a word we selected, you know, because that's what architects do. We give form to ideas. Yeah. And then, of course, there were four of us, so we, we thought it uh, sounded good together. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. A- and how did the business come about? How did it, how did it begin? Yeah. So I'll I'll kind of go back to the beginnings of my time as an architect. Um, When I was in college, uh, I was hired by my, what became my future partner, Robert Giannini, uh, who was a principal at the time at a a firm called DES. And uh, I was hired to just, you know, I was a student. I was hired to do uh, build models, do renderings, help with design work, do anything, you know, that they needed me to do. Mm. So I, you know, through college, I, I did that. And then when I graduated, they hired me full time. Uh, about a year, year and a half into that, my partner, Bob, uh, was asked by another firm to come over and become a principal there. And Bob asked myself and another, um, another one of my bosses as well at the time to come with him. So we went over to this firm, DGA, who at the time and still does specializes in kind of lab biotech work and uh, very technically oriented projects. So they mm-hmm. asked us to come over to kind of bring a, bring sort of our office campus design sort of uh, project types to them and, you know, so they could expand that in that market. And we were over there for about a year, um, Bob, David and I, and it just wasn't working out. It wasn't a good match, you know, just culturally and just kind of what we wanted to do. And so um, in that time we were just sort of talking and uh, we used to go to lunch a lot and I, we just kind of one day, I think I threw out the idea, well, why don't we just start our own firm? Um, this was in uh, 98, 1998. 
And, you know, I was fairly young at the time, you know, just threw out an, an idea and uh, it took and we went for it. So in December of 98, we started Form 4 in the, mm-hmm. um, in the living room or dining room of my flat in San Francisco until we moved into our, our permanent space. So, Fantastic. Yeah. And those early projects, how did you get those through the door? Yeah, so we started Form 4 with two fairly significant size projects. Uh, one was a five-story office building for a, a client of ours called Sobrato Development, who is you know, one of the kind of the big developers in the Bay Area, um, been around for a long time. And so uh, we had been working with them uh, at DES Architects. So we got to know them there and did a project for them. And they, when we went off on our own, they asked us to do another project, you know, another building next door to the building we had done already for them. And then also at the same time, a long, another longtime client that Bob had been working for for years, uh, an athletic club client. Um, we did a 90,000 foot athletic club for them down in San Diego. So those two projects got us going, you know, and they were pretty significant in size, um, you know, kept us going for years. And then that allowed us to uh, give us the time to, to, to go out and get other work, you know, in the meantime. So um, yeah, it just started out with four of us just working on those two projects. Amazing. Yeah. And, and how many of there are you now? As partners or as partners, you're asking? But both, both as partners and the yeah, whole team. So we're now three partners. Uh, my partner, Bob Giannini, who I mentioned earlier, he retired in 2020. Yeah. Um, and so we have another junior partner, James Defed, who came on. He's been with us for, seven, I don't know, 17 years probably. And um, it's probably about five five or so years ago, he came on as a partner and um, he's, so there's the three of us, John, myself and James. And then as far as staff count, we're about, about 40 right now. Okay. Um, which is the largest we've, we've been in our, in our history. So it's a, how, how quickly did it take you to get to 40? Has it been a kind of incremental, <laughs> not, non-noticeable growth or had it, has it kind of gone up in surges and. Yeah, it was, uh, there's definitely a surge. So, I mean, for our, you know, we're into our 23rd year now. Um, mm. For the bulk of it, we were in that 20 to 25 person range for, I'd say, the majority of it. Um, you know, in 2008, 2009, with the, the crash that happened around here, we were about that size and then we dropped down significantly. I think we got down to like nine or 10 in 2009, yeah. uh, late 2009 and early 2010. And then when 2010 came, things just started picking up and we started steadily growing, got around that, you know, again, that 20, 25 um, person range. But then in 2018, starting and then we, we just started, we started having success and finding even more work, needing more people. And then through 2019, we hired probably 12, 13 people in that one year, 2020, kind of a similar thing. Now, of course you lose some people along the way. So, you know, you, I always find that you pick up two people, you, you lose one person. It's sort of this weird <laughs> phenomenon that happens. And, um, but yeah, so um, it's, it's really the 2018 to now that we kind of got into that 35 to 40 range and have been consistently around there for now and, and could even see us, you know, going to the 50 range and, and beyond. Um, mm. We're, for various reasons, we're, we're um, expanding and it's not so much that we're, looking to expand and be a certain size. It's just that where, where we are in the company um, with Bob leaving, uh, you know, it sort of prompted a, a, a looking at sort of like, okay, what, you know, when a partner leaves, it has a big impact, of course. And you start yeah. thinking about each, each partner probably starts thinking about their own individual, you know, path here towards the end. And, um, you know, so you start thinking about, okay, how do I transition uh, out of the company at some point? And you want to, and we'd like the company to continue on beyond us, each one of us. So you start looking for the next generation and to find the next generation, you of course need people to contribute on the business development front to, mm. to make that happen because, you know, you obviously need to keep bringing projects in and as a, as a business development partner leaves, you've got to replace that and, you know, backfill it. So in the process, what you do is you start looking for people that can help with that. And when they start having success and, and, you, your, the current partners are already kind of doing their current thing. Well, what that means is you're sort of adding more projects to the, you know, to the mix. And mm-hmm. so you, you're needing more people because you now have, let's say, three or four people finding work. 
and you know we're all, all finding work at different levels but that just sort of naturally causes the growth to happen yeah um, you know so you're in looking for the next generation you just that's kind of what happens so that's really interesting um talking about you know when one partner leaves then there needs to be somebody who fills the gap particularly in, in terms of right. business development as well yeah um, and then this business development is something we talk a lot about on the, on the podcast not necessarily something that um architects have always been trained in so right. how do you cultivate good hunters if you like <laughs> Yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, architects, like you said, are not trained for that. <clears throat> the whole business side, the marketing side of, of architecture is not something you find out about until years into your career. And, mm. and, and you know, most, most architects don't get into their careers to, you know, be salesmen, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so, or run <laughs> businesses or manage people or, you know, so that's, it's a very small group of people that you have to work with to do that. Um, you know, for myself, it, it wasn't something I was, that I was focused on when I was a young architect. It was something I kind of had to do for the sake of the business and, and, you know, to keep going. So my, our, my partner, Bob, he would, when we started the company, he was the real, he was the main, you know, guy bringing in the work, you yeah. know, and, and um, I was a much younger, younger architect still kind of, you know, learning all that I needed to learn at the time. And I was doing also, you know, doing design work, doing drawings, doing just everything, you know, project management and everything in between. But business development really wasn't my focus and it, and it wasn't sort of needed at the time. But, you know, again, as Bob was, you know, much older than I was, he was 20, he was 20 years older than myself. So it, it actually in the long run turned out to be a good thing that our ages were so different because it allowed me to develop into that position that was needed ultimately. Yeah. Um, and then there became a time when we were overlapping, you know, on our success in business development. And that was sort of the optimum time for the company. Um, so I sort of had to get into it cause you just, I just had to do it, you know, like it's, I'm a business owner and we needed to bring in work. And, and um, so then now as we're looking for the next generation uh, to do it, um, you know, we have, as more important as a company, we, we have to invest in people, um, give them the time to have success. Cause it's, you know, it's not easy. You have to, you know, build a network and you've got to have success on your projects and then build your reputation. And then, you know, most of our work comes from, comes from referrals and repeat business. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we don't do a lot of cold calling and, and chasing of work in that way. I mean, yeah. Um, so it really relies on us doing good work over time and building those relationships. And, you know, that of course takes time. It's not like you just say like, Oh, well this year I'm, I'm going to start doing business development and I'm going to bring in, you know, this many millions of dollars in work. It's, it just is a gradual thing. And you can, you can, you can, you can map it out. It's pretty interesting to see how you went from this project to this client, from that one to this client, you know, and, and so on. It's a, it's a pretty obvious thing once it's happening, <laughs> It's yeah. just not that, it's just not that easy to do, um, you know, for various reasons. So, um, but we're, we're getting to the point now where we're trying to sort of spread that responsibility around the office and, and even get our, our, you know, next layer of leadership to start sort of keeping their eyes and ears open for opportunities and, mm -hmm. and how to, how to sort of capitalize on those opportunities. So a lot of discussions these days about that, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. When you started to learn business development, what were some of the disciplines that, that you actively engaged with or activities? Oh, what are the things that, that I did or do? Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, the business development thing started out not, not really as a business development um, focus. It was, I got... I got a, a new client through a referral from an old client. Uh, this new client was, well, it was a company called Workday. At the time, they were very small, you know, seven people. We helped them basically do their first office. Mm -hmm. Did that project, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't complicated. It wasn't, uh, you know, that demanding in terms of the other things we do. And so, but it came off well. And, you know, a few years went by, about a year, year, year and a half, and you know, you get lucky, this particular company started doing well, and they, they needed to grow. And they called, called us back and said, Hey, we're now taking over this five story building. And um, we'd like you to, you know, 
do what you did over there, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So we did the five story building for them. The, you know, the, this is an interiors thing. Um, and then again, they had more success. They were kept growing. They then moved into an, uh, a campus next door, multiple buildings. They asked us to, you know, continue on with them. And, and so we, you know, we evolved with them as they evolved and grew. And we, and it, again, it's sort of just like, you know, doing good work and, um, and becoming a good partner with them is really was the key. You know, it's, mm. it was listening to them and then they saw that and they just continued working with us. So it, it's, it's sort of the model of just, you know, do good work and they'll come back kind of thing. And then, and so from that project for myself personally, cause I was overseeing it, you know, it led to other projects. You know, I met a lot of people on those projects along the way. And then they, those people introduced me to other people and, or, you know, they moved on to other companies and they were looking for an architect. So, so that's where it kind of really, really started out for me. And, um, mm. and then I kind of saw how it worked, you know, from a, personal experience point of view, you know, it's like, okay, I see this. Um, you know, and a lot of it is just the way you interact and the way you communicate with your clients and, and reassuring them and, and the confidence and, and um, kind of having the right answers is what they're looking for. So um, you've got a, a, you know, you've got, a, you've got a, a kind of portfolio which is in various different sectors did you start off in one specific sector and then branch out or were there kind of very proactive moves of like right we want to be engaged with you know office interiors we want to be engaged with uh, more civic based work yeah so you know when we started 20 something years ago we were already the, the, the work that we had done at past firms was definitely um, office work you know mm. mostly actually ground up buildings, you know, so not so much interiors, although we had some interior background, but so we were doing office work and athletic clubs. Those were kind of two markets that form for, um, you know, started with, and to this day, we still obviously maintain that and, and it's even stronger than it, than it was. But so, and then the interior side came, um, that first project I mentioned to you earlier on the Serato project. So we get a lot of interiors projects by introduction of our developer clients. So, you know, we did the five-story ground up building a company called Brio Technologies decided to take it over. We inter we got the introduction to them. We interviewed, so it was a competitive situation, but we won, we won the interiors. And so, you know, that was sort of my, my second project as form four was really that one too. Um, so the interior thing started very slowly growing over time. It wasn't something we were really, I wouldn't consider, wouldn't, we wouldn't consider ourselves like an interior design firm at the time. It was just kind of like we were architects that did office buildings. And then we gradually got into interiors work and, you know, we kind of, I'd say sort of faked it for years, you know, as architects, yeah. we didn't really, we didn't really have interior design staff yet. We were just doing it as architects and, and, you know, doing well with it, but um, it wasn't a, a focus, but what happened was, you know, you start to do a couple of those. And then I started getting into interiors a lot with just, like I said, that one project with Workday and it just kind of snowballed. And then I, you know, you kind of wake up one day, you're like, wait a minute, you know, this is a whole market we have now let's be more proactive about it and, and sort of hire the right staff, mm. you know, really, really then on a business development side, go after work, you know, specifically go after it. So, so that happened for us in, uh, you know, about 2016 or so we, we started like ramping it up. And, and then when, then we started getting work for like Google and Facebook, and then that sort of like took it to the next level where, you know, once you start winning projects like that for basically, you know, some of the largest companies in the Bay Area, um, you then have to step up your game. You, you do have to make sure you have the right people and yeah. you're organized correctly and, and, and all that. So, um, so then now, yeah, now we're one of now actually more than 50% of our work is, is interiors for workplace projects where, um, you know, if you look at our sort of, uh, our financial thing, you can sort of see the, the climb of interiors over the last five, six years to the point where it's exceeding the, the sort of regular architecture stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so, so it, that was a conscious effort from a, just a pure business point of view. And it was, and also we just had the opportunities and it just kind of grows. And so you go for it. So, but the other things we are again, in the last, we've been talking about diversification for a long time because obviously office can crash, you know, 2008, it just goes away. And what saved us back then is we actually had some athletic club work that, that kept us going. Um, so we're now, we're now more focused on doing biotech work, 
Uh, we're doing multifamily housing, more of that. We're doing more, you know, mixed use projects. Um, and then there's other, you know, projects in between that we're doing as well. So we're definitely proactively trying to diversify. We brought on a life science director just this year, early this year. We now have an interior director. Um, so again, we're just, we are trying to push into other markets and, mm. and get, you know, sort of make those profit centers just as strong as our workplace one. So. What, what, what's the process that you go through to identify where an emerging market might be or where there's market opportunities? Yeah, I would say, I'd say we kind of do it on an opportunistic way. <laughs> That's like, like bio, bio, uh, the biotech thing is kind of a, a good example. Um, probably 2017 or so, I was introduced to a company called Zeltik. Um, and they're not necessarily a biotech, they're more of a medical device type company. So I was introduced to them by, a, by what we, you know, an owner's rep who does a lot of life science projects. And we were, we were brought in mainly for our workplace background experience, but there was a little bit of technical spaces involved. And, and so, you know, we were able to sort of get in the door, you know, did a good job there. And then that same owner's rep then recommended us to another truly biotech company. Um, again, most of that was a workplace related project, but there was some labs in that project. Mm. And so yeah. we did, a, we got to sort of do our first labs. Um, and then it just kind of goes from there. Uh, you know, that same, we did that second project in a, in, a, in a campus that has a lot of biotech companies. They're kind of like small to mid-sized companies that are sort of building out their first spaces, yeah. you know, af- after their startup mode. And, you know, it just, from there, we get introduced to the next one. And then we got, and then we got to know the, the property manager who introduced us to the next tenant. And so now suddenly you wake up and, you know, three, four years later, you've got five or six biotech type projects on, in your portfolio now. And so when, when kind of when I, I came to the realization, I'm like, okay, we've been, again, we've been doing it sort of in this, you know, we got into it because people recommended us and now, we did a good job. And so we have a certain number under our belt. Let's be more proactive. We decided to hire a, a life science director, a guy who really has, you know, a history and a, his whole, you know, his whole career has been in, the, in that world. Hmm. And so to go after the sort of bigger projects, um, we needed that sort of legitimate person to, to help with that. I mean, we have the little portfolio now to go with, but to really go after it. So now we're, you know, we're, we just turned in a proposal for a UCSF lab project would have never done that, you know, probably without him on board, he's got UCSF experience. Right. Um, it's the right scale for us still. It's not so large that they would, you know, they would look at us and be like, I know we're not, you know, we're sort of appropriately, we're appropriate for it. It's like, you know, we're not going after too much. It's, it sort of matches the scale of the projects we have done for other companies. So yeah, you just kind of, like I said, you do, you, you get in the door, you know, in some way and then do a good job. And then you, then you go from there, then you're get more proactive about it. So um, with with many of these you know biotech companies some of the tech companies that you mentioned there as well facebook and and google do they operate in a similar way to match the institutional um clients work so in terms of the, their tendering processes or they have framework agreements which you have to kind of compete to get on or is it a bit more kind of you know behind closed doors negotiations if you like oh yeah, it's it's definitely different um, than more sort of public type work is what you're maybe you're comparing it to. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, with Google, which is one of my one of my clients, um, it's been interesting. They had a process where you know every job had to be bid out. You know, with multiple by multiple, you know multiple architects had to sort of turn in a proposal. Right. <clears throat> And, and then, you know, they, they gave us a shot, um, in the beginning and, you know, we went through that first one, didn't get that one, but it was a good, uh, sort of learning experience. They got to know us a bit more Then the next one comes along. And then when the next one came along, it was, it wasn't so competitive. They were kind of like wanting us to do that particular project. Mm -hmm. And so they just kind of made it happen. They, they maybe deviated a little bit from their, what they would consider their normal process. And, and that's what happens with these, with these firms. They, they, they tend, they tell you there's a process and then they can, they can just change it on the dime if they want, you know? So the last couple of projects with them have not been competitive. We've just, they just called us up. We negotiated a, a fee, an appropriate fee and did the project. So there was no comp- competitive situation going on. 
where of course in the more public type work, the UCSF stuff, that's not how it works. It's, it's always, it's always a, a very formal process yeah. filling out the, filling out the very specific documents that they give you. Um, not even turning in a fee because they're just trying to select somebody purely on qualification. Mm. And then from there you would negotiate a fee. Um, and, and if you don't negotiate a fee, they look to the next person after that was after you. So it's, so yeah, it's a totally different process. I mean, these, the, the tech, the tech private companies have a lot more flexibility in what they can, yeah. what they can do. So, and it, it's, it's kind of part of the reason we haven't done a lot of like public work um, type projects in the past. It's just, we're, we're so used to working with developers and tech clients that are just, it's, it's more about the relationships. And, you know, mm. once you have the good relationships, you just sort of work out your proposals with them and, you know, make it happen. But well, this um, is always an interesting, you know, question of how, of how a business needs to manage the kind of risk that's involved of doing public work and mm -hmm. perhaps some of your, the normal things that you would do to negotiate are kind of taken away from you. And, you know, you know, you're yeah. not allowed to, you know, in some cases as well, you're not even allowed to approach some yep. of the, you know, certain parties that are involved, otherwise you'll be in breach of certain rules. How have you managed that risk with the kind of public work versus private work? And is it, has it been wrapped up in this, in the strategy of diversification? Yeah, it's definitely like, like you say, very different because in the, in the private work, it's, you know, it's much more based on relationship. Um, you know, you just build up these relationships over the years with people in those companies or those developers. Um, so your chance of winning something is, is more connected to your relationship than it is your pure talent or your pure abilities. Yeah. Where in the private work, public sector work, yeah, you, you're not, you can't get connected to those people in the same way. I mean, not during the, the proposal process, you know, you obviously have relationships with people probably in those organizations, but yeah, you can't just call them up in the same way and, and, you know, talk through things and, and which, you know, in our world, in our business, about, you know, you always, we always talk about your, you sort of need to have about seven or more contacts with somebody before they're even going to give you even a shot at a project. So it's like, when you, when you don't have those ways of doing that, it's very hard to get in, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, we're dealing, we're dealing with that right now in the UCSF thing. I mean, our, our new life science director has past experience with UCSF form four does not, um, so the question will be, do they look past that and see the, the kind of experience he has? Will that get us over the hump? You know, and, and we'll see. I mean, that, it'll help certainly. But so, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, we, like I said, the public work stuff has been not a big part of our overall portfolio. You know, yeah. we're, 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 for the sake of diversification, we're wanting to push into it. Um, and we have to push into it by getting project types or, or similar types of experience that will hopefully convince them that we're qualified because it's, they, they look at it from a more numbers point of view. I mean, they actually create sort of these matrix things that you got to satisfy, like, you know, you get a score in all these different categories. Um, you know, and if you, if you just don't have anything in that one category, you're kind of out, you know? Yeah. So you, you, you try to make, you try to make it look like you have as much as you can. <laughs> And, you know, so have you, have you ever collaborated with other practices or other firms to kind of, you know, you know, to perhaps leverage each other's talents or past experiences? When oh yeah, we have, we've, we've joint ventured with a lot of companies over the years on projects. Um, not, not anything in the public sector yet, although it's something we do consider. Um, but whenever we look at a project, that's sort of outside of our, our, our wheelhouse, so to speak, you know, maybe that maybe it's a mixed use project that involves, you know, office and housing. And while we're starting to do housing, more housing these days, we're certainly nowhere near like, you know, the firms that just, that's all they do. So we have, uh, we have teamed up with a housing part uh, architect that reached out to us actually, because they were going after a, actually it was a more public works project down in um, the South Bay. They, uh, it was for a county um, and it had a big housing component, but it also had a very large office component. And this particular housing architect didn't have the kind of office experience that they could go in there alone. So they invited us. Um, so yeah, that happens quite a bit. Um, we also team up with architects out of the area mm -hmm. that somehow got a project 
in California um, through their, again, through a relationship with a client that's, and so, but they're not the local architects so they are looking for a, a local architect to be the architect of record. Um, so we've done quite a few of those projects uh, over the years. And those have been great because we get introduced to a new client. Um, and often what we find is we actually end up with that client in the long run. Um, right. You know, so, so it's, you know, we're not necessarily the design architect, the, the, the first project, but usually the projects after that, we ended up being, we ended up being this design architect and, and doing, you know, projects for those clients for years. So it, it, those are great ways to, to meet people. Um, Brilliant. How, yeah. how, how do you engage with work? And I, I know that you've got a lot of work in places like South Korea and in Taiwan, or you've, you've done, mm-hmm. you've done, you've, you've had proposals there. Um, yeah. How, how does that process work when you're looking at work overseas? Yeah, I mean, so the way that we usually get into that work is my partner, John Marks, um, who's our uh, chief artistic officer, a design principal. Uh, he came from a firm that did a lot of overseas work. And so he had built some relationships at that time. And when he came over to us, you know, he, people would call him up and say, hey, we're going to go after this project and South Korea or India, um, and they're looking for a design architect. They're looking for an American design architect. So we would we would get teamed up with a, a local architect out there. Um, a lot of them are competition based. Mm-hmm. So the competition actually is it's very different than we do in America. But over there, they would form teams of the contractor, the local architect, the design you know, sort of the Western design architect. Um, it would be a paid situation. You might, you know, be competing against five other similar groups. They would pay each one of those groups. And um, uh, so that's kind of how we got into those. Uh, haven't, we haven't been doing those so much in the last few years, just because honestly, we've been so busy in California and Silicon Valley and San Francisco that it's, you know, just haven't needed to kind of look out outside so much, but we are now, we are now proactively um, pursuing more design competition work. Uh, mm-hmm. around the world um in fact we're we just found out yesterday we've been asked to uh, get involved in a paid competition um so that was very exciting because we haven't done one in a while but we we decided um just this year mainly to really focus on it to again help us diversify help us get into sort of um, new project types that you you know you just normally can't get into without the competition opportunity yeah, um, and it can really, you know, if you if you win such a competition, it can really launch you um, into a totally different market and and, and different sort of level of uh, design work that we're sought for. So, have you in the past um, entered into a number of quite a lot of competitions? Was that always a, a has that been a valuable business development method for you guys? Well, we uh, we did do it consistently for quite a while in. Uh, you know, in India, South Korea, and China, um, and, and actually had pretty good, very good success, actually got some mm-hmm. projects built. Um, and, you know, one of them, we still market pretty heavily. Um, it was one in India. Um, but we, we haven't been doing it for a while. And so, like I said, we're getting back into it. Um, it's, it's, we haven't, we haven't taken it to the level that, you know, some other larger firms would, um, where, you know, you kind of just go all in and you, you open up an office there and, and we, we typically don't operate that way. I mean, we kind of do it organically and s- sort of opportunistically and see where it goes and, and um, don't just sort of throw down a bunch of money um, and, and then kind of, and then, you know, sort of roll the dice. It's, it's not been our approach. I mean, we just, we're sort of trying to be smart about it um, because we, we, do, we, we do know about a, a lot of firms that have, you know, lost a lot of money working in Asia. Um, uh, so it's, we're kind of just doing it through some relationships and contacts and, and, um, and we're, you know, sort of at a small scale, um, yeah. we can do, and then we can still do well doing that. So, and, and John, you know, he, he's able to, you know, produce design work, often single-handedly, you know, sort of on his off hours, so to speak, um, and, you know, do, do quite well with it. So, um, but we are, again, we are this year and beyond, we're, we're trying to be more proactive about it and focus less on a, like awards and more on let's produce more work, more portfolio. Mm. Even if you don't win the competitions, what it does is it expands your portfolio and you have more material to, you know, use for marketing. Um, so it's, it's a good, good, good thing to do. So. Great. 
I, I'm interested in in the relationship between you, you and Paul, and the and uh, your your other partners, um, mm-hmm. and how you distinguish the role of, you know, of CEO. And mm-hmm. I know um, John is CFO or C, or C artistic CAO, yeah, CAO, CAO yeah. C, <laughs> Chief yeah. Artistic Officer. Yeah, and this is really interesting as well because that does that mean then that you're no longer involved in any of the creative activities of the practice and are purely in the no, in, in yeah. a pure CEO role, if you like, or how, how no, does that? Yeah, yeah. So it, we, I, I don't know how unique our situation is, but I'll I'll try to describe it. So, and maybe I'll go back to a little bit of the beginning about how those things even started. We, yeah, please. Uh, probably about five years ago now, um, as we as we were growing, it, it, again, it all had to do with growth. Um, as we were growing, we noticed that the quality across the office from whether it's design quality or production quality, we needed to shift our, our, our methodology, so to speak, um, to make sure we maintain the quality because the quality we had in the past was all made, was all based on a very hands-on principle approach. So, you know, we would, we would literally design everything ourselves. We would draw everything ourselves. I mean, we would have, we would have employees and all that, but we had a very strong hand in almost everything. And, and, so, you know, our drawings were very high quality. There was not a lot of mistakes in them. Uh, the design was high quality because we were doing it ourselves. We weren't relying on staff and we weren't, we didn't have a big hierarchy and a big, you know, structure to, to move information mm-hmm. through. But as you get larger, you notice how much harder it is to maintain that is because you're, you're letting go. You're, in my case, I was letting go of design work. I was letting go of doing, actually being in the drawings. And so as you do that, you look around, you're like, okay, if I'm letting this go, how are we going to, who's going to, do it and how am we going to make sure that that person uh, bring, you know, maintains the same quality that you do as an owner would, you know, cause an owner sort of like gives it everything. Um, so what happened was we, it's it sort of what happened, you know, we, we realized, okay, well, we need to break down as partners, what we're each kind of focused on to make sure those areas of the business are taken care of adequately. Yeah. So John was, John obviously was, you know, he, he doesn't get involved in business development. He doesn't get involved as a principal in charge on projects sort of running and leading projects the way that I do and the way Bob and James were doing. So he was like, you know, an obvious like, guys, I'm, I'm sort of want to lead up the design aspect of the company. Um, and so that was an obvious one. And then at the time, partner Bob was the president. So, you know, he, he, was, he became the CEO at that moment. And then I became the CFO at the moment overseeing the financial, well, CFOO actually was the sort of chief financial operating officer. So, I was sort of tasked with overseeing the day-to-day operational things, the financial aspects of the company. So that's kind of where it started. And then we, we initiated a quality control program. We ended up, we decided we needed to hire, and, and actually James was our chief production officer as well. He was more focused on the sort of production aspect of things, of, you know, producing the drawings mm-hmm. and making sure the quality was the right level. So, so then, a, you know, fast forward a few more years later, and we decided we, you know, we're growing the, even more and the technical aspects of things are, are are, you know, which is a big part of what we do. I mean, design is like a small part, actually. It's like, you know, 10% of the, the a project is design and the rest of it's produ- production and implementation. And um, so as we were growing, we realized, okay, we need to bring on another person, another layer, uh, technical director. So at the end of 2019, we brought that person on. Um, he's been kind of helping both James on the, the sort of chief production officer end of things, but also helping me on the operational side of things. Um, you know, helping with recruiting and, and sort of IT things and anything that's sort of more operational. Um, and then, of course, uh, Bob retired in, in 2020. And so I was made the CEO. Um, my role hasn't really changed too much. It's like I'm the CEO, the CFO and the COO kind of <laughs> all in all in one, <laughs> whatever that means. You know, it's just, um, but so on my projects, you know, I'm still heavily involved in my projects. I'm still the partner, partner mm-hmm. in charge of my projects. So the way that we run things on design is basically it's the partner in charge and John that as a team design the project. Now, John is leading the day-to-day on designing, but what he does is he, he'll develop some ideas. He'll come back to the partner in charge. You know, we'll have a conversation. Um, you know, he'll, he'll refine into, to, you know, basically the partner in charge is supposed to be the eyes and the ears on behalf of the client. You know, we have the client connection, we have the relationship, we kind of are trying to 
be that client before we present to the client. So I'm, I'm giving Jane or I'm giving John input on, you know, what I think the client's going to accept and, and, or maybe the politics behind things that are going on. And, mm-hmm. and he's trying to design for that. Um, and so it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a collaborative effort um, where John and his team is sort of holding the pencil, but the partner in charge sort of has the final say on like, you know, you know, he maybe shows us five options and the partner in charge is, selects, you know, two or three of those and says, let's go with those and, and, right. and then offer some input along the way as well. So, um, you know, in my case, I came from a design background. That's where I started out in architecture. I was more on the designer side than the production side. And, um, and so I still get involved. I still do things, but, but now as CEO and all that, I'm, I'm, you know, my day is, is broken up into 15 minute, half hour increments of, you know, <laughs> meetings and telling, giving somebody direction and dealing with operational things and dealing, you know, so I'm, it's hard for me to, to focus on a project in, the, in a design role the way, let's say, John can, you know, because he's sort of, he's sort of siloed and protected to be able to c- continue that, um, you know, so he doesn't have to worry about writing proposals and going after work and, and you know, dealing with the client on a daily basis the way that the partner in charge mm-hmm. does. So, well, it, it, that, that's, that's a really in, um, you know, quite fascinating way that your career has evolved and how your role has evolved. When you were CFOO, yeah. what were the sorts of things that you were looking at or that you had to get in place in a business of that scale in terms of metrics, what you were measuring, what you were making sure was in place? When did the alarm bells start ringing? <laughs> yeah, right. So, I mean, one of the, the, on, the, on the financial side, one of the first things I did was um, I brought in a new software program uh, to help us sort of really understand what's going on financially. It's a, it's a tool that, that a lot of architects and engineers use. It's sort of designed for our industry and it, it acts both as our accounting program, but it also um, helps in project management. So it's got project management tools into it. it's that scheduling and staffing tools. Um, so it's all sort of blended together into this one program. So that was, that was a big leap for us um, because, you know, in the past we were just doing kind of the basic financial thing, you know, QuickBooks kind of stuff. It's not really designed for an architecture firm. It doesn't yeah. have the kind of reports that an architecture firm would like to look at. Um, so that was really one of the biggest things was, was that. And, and so um, I had to kind of, I had to train myself in how to use it. I had to then train the, 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 the bookkeeper or accounting manager that we have to how to use it. And, um, uh, so we're now after, what is it? We're into our third year of using it. Now I'm, I'm, it's, it's doing what it needs to do. It takes time though. It's, it's a lot of information you got to get in the system and, and then you got to train everybody else in the office to use it. You know, timesheets are all put in there and then our project managers need to build their projects in there. And, and it's, it's interesting to have, see how, um, it's kind of like being, a uh, the captain of a large, uh, ship it's, it takes, it's really hard to move. You know, you know, you want to turn left, you go, go left and you want to turn back, right. It's like getting everybody to move with you and, and, you know, get on the same page is tough because, um, you know, people have their habits They're you know, they like to work a certain way. Um, um, you know, they're architects. They don't really want to focus on that kind of stuff all the time. They don't yep. really want to put information in, in a system and, but it's important. It's like, you know, on a, to manage the company, especially when it starts to grow, um, information is the key, you know, you, you, you need the information in order to make decisions. And, and it's easy to make, to have all the information when you're, you know, 20 people and there's only a handful of products and you can have your hands around all that. And, but now there's, you know, I've got my own list of products going on, but then, you know, James has got his and Colin is adding his and then others are adding theirs. And, I, I, as a CEO and CFO, need to understand what their work is producing from a financial point of view and how many people we really need, you know, because everybody in the office serves like, we need more people, we need more people. Like, say, wait a minute, do we really need more people? Let's, let's really validate mm-hmm. this before we go off and hire five people and realize two months later we need to lay off because we don't really have the, <laughs> the, the backlog for it. So, so yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's information. You're needing that, you need the information to make this. Yeah. Go ahead. What were the sorts of reports or the, the, the kind of the key things that you were always looking to measure? Oh, we still keep it pretty simple. I mean, it's you, over time, you, it's sort of like, you know, how much revenue is each partner bringing in? 
um, you're looking at your break even every month, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and looking at the ratio of, of staff uh, salaries to overhead expenses, making sure those are kind of in the right range. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it comes down to um, just revenue versus the break even. Oftentimes it's, and you know, you're used, to, but then you start, as you gather information, you start looking at interesting things like, okay, what's, what's the average fee per person? You know, I, I never really thought of it that way. It's like, you know, if you look at your billings for the entire year and then you kind of divide by the number of people, you get kind of an interesting number. And you, when you look at that number compared to each person's average salary, you can kind of see, okay, well, you can see what, how, how profitable you can be if you, if you bring in this much fee per person. And so you just, you, as you get all this information, you have a system that can provide it. You start learning the metrics. You know, I've had to kind of learn the metrics and I, it's not like I'm a trained business person. You know, I'm mm-hmm. not, I didn't go to business school. I didn't go to, I don't know, a finance background. I don't, you know, I, you, you kind of really zone in on the prior, like what's truly important in, yeah. in my business to make sure it stays open. Um, well, was, yeah. it, it's, it's really interesting as well, because I suppose you're in San Francisco, you, you're near Silicon Valley, you're in this kind of unique part of the world, which has got some of the most innovative businesses around yeah. and you know some of your clients google facebook and and others are obviously you know at the at the apex if you like of that kind of innovation and entrepreneurship what are the sorts of lessons that you've learned about running a business from some of those types of clients if any ooh yeah that's interesting because i mean they're those kind of clients their scale is so much different i mean it's mm you know, it's hard to, it's hard to relate to that. I mean, it's oftentimes I work for these client clients and I'm like, what are all these people doing? I just don't, you know, <laughs> like, I honestly don't know what all these people, like that. I, I got that hit when I was doing the, when I was working for Workday where, you know, like I said, I started out with, there were seven people and now they're like 6,000, 7,000 people around the world. And oftentimes as I watched them grow, I was, I was just like, what, are, who, what are all these people doing? I just don't understand, you know, but so yeah, they're just at a different, a different level in terms of their, their numbers. So it's hard to, to pick a lot out of it, but I would say that, um, you know, for us being nimble and flexible is huge. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say that's probably the same for all these tech clients. I mean, they, you've got to be able to adjust, you know, very, very fast. Um, you know, obviously they're in the innovation world. And so a new innovation comes along, whether it's from themselves or from a competitor, and they're going to have to pivot fast to figure out like what that all means. Yeah. Um, and for us, we're this, we're kind of the same way. I mean, we, with our clients being so, you know, the tech oriented clients who are evolving constantly, we, I've always, i I say this all the time that to be a great, to be an expert in workplace is to, to have the ability to evolve with your clients and understand them and, and adjust with them. Um, because all the other stuff is pretty easy. I mean, we all, there's great interior designers out there. They all know how to pick finishes, but you got to really like become a partner with those clients and, and change with them. If you don't, you'll be lost. You will fall aside. I mean, it's, it's so easy to not mm-hmm. keep up with them. You know, I mean, if you think about a, a, a small tech company, that's a startup who doesn't know anything about building spaces and then fast forward, you know, two, three years later, now they've got a facilities person. They've got a head of real estate. They've got all these people that are now looking at you and saying, mm, I wonder if this architect's really qualified. And so they start looking around and you have to, wow if you don't demonstrate your, you know, your qualification on a regular basis and step up with them when they're now asking for more, you'll fall off. I mean, oftentimes that's what happens. You start out with somebody that's small and then they look at you that way. They look like, Oh, they're just a company that helps companies start out. They don't look at you as a person who helps large companies. And so you can, I've had that happen to us. I mean, I've learned my lessons about that. You have to make sure you keep them apprised of what, of, your abilities, you know, on a regular basis. And, and, but you're also trying to make that balance where you don't want to push them uh, beyond what they're ready for. And also you don't want to design for your own agenda, so to speak. I mean, you want to make sure you're still designing for what they're looking for and what they're needing. So Mm -hmm. it's a fine line between being a good listener and being more passive versus being a leader. Um, You know, some, you can wake up one day and a client will be like, I want more of an architect that's going to lead us is this architect a leader or is they, or are they just a listener that just reacts to what we tell them? So it's, 
that, that's that's really interesting actually yeah. about how to manage that balance between yeah well we're you know we're kind of engaging with you and you're at this scale in your pra- in your business yeah. over, for now they go through some rapid growth and then they then they the natural thing is like well those are the architects that you right. know that they oh, yeah. us when we were young and small they're not going to be yeah. able, we, we need something bigger oh yeah that is a that phenomenon is there all the time <laughs> yep what what have been some of the keys have you found in in being able to consistently demonstrate expertise that a client didn't know that you had? Is there an active way that you that you can do that? Or yeah, well, so I have done that where you're working for a client, you know, for a long time, and they're growing and they're wanting more, um, and they may not be they may not directly communicate it to you. You know, you can just either, I mean, hopefully they do. That's a great thing because then mm-hmm. you can actually respond to it. But some, but oftentimes they don't, they'll just go out and hire another one and they'll contact you and say, ah, you know, we decided to try something new. And, but so keeping that in mind, what I'll often do is, you know, keep those clients um, up to date on the other things we're up to, you know, it's, Hey, by the way, did you know that we just finished this project with so-and-so? you know, with Google, let's say who, you know, is sort of at the top of the, the, the chain on, on, mm-hmm. you know, workplace interiors. I mean, you know, it's like Google, Apple, Facebook, you know, if you're in with those, then you're obviously you're in with the top firms in the world. And so if you can let the other people you're working with know that as well and show them also what you're doing, because they are interested in knowing what you're doing. They want to know, like, what are those guys designing over there? You know, can I, can I get a little bit of that kind of thing? So yeah. that happens all the time, you know, especially our, especially our developer clients who, um, who are looking, who are getting tenants and they introduce us to tenants and they want to kind of sell, you know, let's say sell us, you know, mm-hmm. they want to say, Oh, these guys, yeah, they work for so-and-so and, you know, so, so, you know, they're building our reputation up and so to speak. So yeah, it's keeping them up to date with what you're doing. Um, you know, if you're publishing stuff, obviously that, you're getting to publish your your thought of as sort of you know a thought leader kind of thing that yep. that obviously helps um, you know these kind of these kind of activities we're we're engaged with right now you know talking to people and getting that out getting the word out um, all that yeah keeps keeps them up to date but then then it's also just asking them like directly hey you know you, you know just sort of pushing them a little bit you know exposing them to some other ideas that they might not have thought about it's it, it's all there you know it's all it takes. So. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, as the business has been growing, obviously the you know the recruiting and bringing on new team members, and you mentioned there earlier about you know you have to be aware of do we actually need five new team members or is now the right time? Yeah. And and when I speak to firms all around the world, hiring is you know at a certain scale in business, hiring becomes one of the most frightening, challenging, difficult aspects of a business. Getting it wrong can cost a business, you know, 30 to a hundred thousand dollars each time or more. Um, how have you navigated that process and kind of refined it over the last 23 years? Yeah, I would say it's, it's definitely one of the most difficult aspects of the business is the recruiting. Um, and also an expensive enterprise. And, mm-hmm. and when I say that it's because, you know, these days we're relying heavily on recruiters um, it's sort of a love hate relationship because you're <laughs> they're you know, they're, they're bringing you people, but it's just so expensive. You know, they're charging their fees and you wake up after a year and you're like, Oh my God, look how much we just spent on recruiting fees. And you, you, and I, I mean, I literally had this conversation with my our technical director and the others in the office who are helping with recruiting. It's like, guys, we got to find another way. This is, you know, I'd rather give this money to, to, the people in the firm, you know, I'd, I'd rather bonus this out than give it to these recruiters. It's like, but it, you're kind of stuck because how do you get access to people? We're not at the scale of an office where we would have our own, you know, somebody dedicated to mm-hmm. looking to, to recruiting, you know, like, I mean, if you're a large firm, you, they, those people usually have dedicated people. They're not outsourcing the recruiting. So, I mean, so they're paying somebody, but they're paying at a salary. We're paying at, you know, sort of consulting fees, which, you know, is obviously going to be higher in the long run. So yeah, it's a frustrating situation. Um, uh, but you kind of just have to take it. <laughs> it's like, so you know, we, the primary way that you, you find new stuff is typically through recruiters. You don't have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we have, we do offer our staff 
uh, a recruiting bonus. So if they introduce us to people, we, we offer them something and I always prefer that. And, but you know, what happens there is um, it, it's worked out. I mean, we have brought in people that way and some good people, but you know, those people, our staff only have so many contacts, friends that they know that, you know, are potential candidates. So it's not, that doesn't go on forever. You know, you kind of, you kind of get all the, all the access you're going to get within a time, a certain small time period. And then that's it. So, so it's been a couple of years now since we've gotten somebody that way. Um, uh, so yeah, we, we have a handful of recruiters um, and, you know, pay them for what we need to do, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. And it's, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of expended time, even on our side, you know, it's like we have that first interview, then the second interview and, you know, maybe a third one, if somebody couldn't make the second one. And, you know, then it's, then it's, us all talking about the candidate and, you know, building consensus around the idea. And, uh, yeah. you know, some people are, are, you know, lobbying for that person more than others. And so it's, and, and in my position, I'm, I'm the guy who writes the last offer, you know, writes the offer letter, sort right. of does the final negotiation. And it's not necessarily somebody that I personally need to hire, or I think we need to hire, but others in the office think we do. So I often tell them like, basically convince me that, we need to hire this person and that we should hire this particular person. I mean, it's like, I, I need to be convinced, you know, it's, so they all have to learn to make their, make their pitch, so to speak. Cause well, um, for, for you, what, what is a kind of a sure thing? Or what, what for you is convincing? Well, on the, in, on the, in both the, the right person and the role that we need this. Kind yeah. of role. I mean, first with the role. Um, yeah. It's just demonstrating that on, on these particular projects, we have, we have a hole. I mean, we need, there's, is a role that is, needs to be filled. Um, so we're constantly discussing that. In fact, I mean, every Tuesday morning, uh, we have uh, what we call leadership meetings. So it's the principals and the directors of the firm. And, and honestly, most of what we talk about is staffing. It's, it's unbelievable how much time is spent just talking about who's going to, who's working on which projects and and, you know, how's this project, we just brought this project in, who's going to be on it. And mm. um, so it's, that one is just ongoing conversations. You know, we, we actually just brought in or are starting a new tool that I, I mentioned to you earlier that we had brought on a financial ma project management tool, 2018 yeah. uh, called Ajera. Uh, it's by Dell tech. And so we've now discovered there's another uh, software out there that plugs into that one. And, but it's more designed for the staffing aspect of it and the, and the project scheduling side of it. It's much more graphic and sort of more intuitive and easier to use. Mm -hmm. So we're right in the middle of, of getting that thing up and running. And that thing is hopefully going to sort of just really kind of clearly demonstrate on the screen, like, okay, here, here's what we really need. Um, so there's that, there's just that, I mean, it's, it's people sort of, because I'm like, let's say I'm not part of those projects. I, I still need to be convinced that they're needed. So you know, our interior director who kind of oversees most of the interiors projects, she's, she's in the position of understanding what's needed on every project on an interior side. So she really has the pulse. So then she needs to come to me and the rest of the group and sort of say, Hey guys, I, I really need a job captain for these reasons in these projects. So then on the person side, I mean, that it, what happens usually is the te our technical director usually has that first interview. He's sort of the, you know, the, the gatekeeper uh, in the beginning, um, he then comes back to the group and says, Hey guys, I had this interview with so-and-so. I think, you know, they'd be a good fat, like, you know, one of the part, you know, two or three of the partners meet him, meet him or her. And so I'll often be one of those partners that come in and I'll, I'm, I'm mainly, you know, for me, I'm trying to get out of the person, not their technical skills as an architect, yeah. I'm, I'm more looking for them as a person. Uh, are they a good fit culturally? Are they, can I get a sense that they're, um, you know, going to stand behind their word and follow through and, uh, you know, just have a good attitude, be a good team player. I mean, just more of those sort of personal things that you look for in people that, um, that are very hard to get out of people until you really work with them. But you yeah. try to ask a few questions here and there that gives, gives you a sense of also what their goals are. Are they aligned with ours? You know, um, what, are, what are their role, their expectations are on their roles? Cause oftentimes, you know, people are thinking that they're interviewing for, job X, but you're actually offering job Y. And, and so you want to make sure that they don't come in here because we have had that happen. Of course, we've hired people that thought that presented themselves as more than they are. Mm. And then you're frustrated, you know, three months into it, you're like, oh man, it's, 
they're not what they thought they said they were. So yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a, and then you got to, you got to make an adjustment. You got to figure out, okay, we now understand who they are, what they're capable of. We got to, you know, sort of adjust here and, and put them in the right space for success. Um, so, you know, my, you know, I, my role as our, as CEO, I think about this a lot is my job is to make the company better and mm-hmm. to make the people better. And that's really my CEO role is to, um, is to make everybody better in some way. So I'm, and I'm, I'm constantly looking for improvement from us individually and also us as a company. So um, that's what I focus on, just the people side of things and how to get the best out of them. Uh, and also to put them in the right spot for, for success and not failure. And, so. and- and on to, to kind of conclude, I think that's a perfect place to conclude. What are, what are some of the keys to ensuring that you get the best out of your team? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, communi- regular communication with people, uh, really understanding what they're about, um, you know, what they most love to do mm-hmm. and um, putting them, like I, I've said this a couple of times, it's like putting them in the right spot, not not sort of fitting that with that, that square peg into a round hole kind of thing. I mean, oftentimes as architects, we'll do that. Uh, we'll, we'll think like, Oh, you know, this person is a, a, a project architect. you know, that's a, that's a particular title and role. Um, yeah. but you know, maybe, maybe you discover they're not really, they're, they're more of a project manager type or they're, or they're not qualified yet to be a true project architect. So, you, you want to push people to their limits, um, you know, in terms of their capabilities so that they're challenged and they're excited and all that, but you don't want to push it beyond that they, they fail and we all fail on a project. So um, I, I find it's like, it's getting to know them as best you can mm. and having those open conversations ultimately with them as well and aligning their, their goals and, and what they think they should be doing with the reality of, you know, some people want, some architects want to be designers. Well, there's actually very few people that are actually truly serving as designers in that way. So they, so then you get people that are frustrated, you know, like, yes. Oh, how come I'm not designing that project? How come so-and-so is, you know, like why am you know? So yeah, it's, it's just constant conversations with people and uh, um, being open and honest about it, you know, give clear, being clear is the, I, the most important thing. We sometimes suffer from, not being direct with people and being clear with what the expectations are. So they don't know, they don't know what they're trying to do for us mm-hmm. sometimes. And that's our, that's our, you know, that's our failure, not their failure. So, Brilliant. Um, yeah. So what's, what's the rest of 21 got planned for you? Oh, you know, it, I mean, with COVID, you know, obviously we didn't even talk about that. That's a whole nother you know, <laughs> podcast in itself, but you know, in 2020, I, as, as one of the partners, I, and as CEO, you keep, you keep thinking like, okay, when is this thing going to just crash? You know, it's, and 2020 ended up being, you know, our second biggest year ever, wow. you know, with 2019 being our biggest year. Um, but, you know, it was a, it was a great year. And um, so then you go into 2021 and you kind of have the same, a little bit of the same feelings. You're like, you know, what's, you know, we're all, we're all in uncertain territory here. We don't know what's, what's happening exactly. So, but Hired a couple people at the beginning of the year. Um, projects are still going forward. Nothing is nothing's been on, put on hold or just completely stopped. Our our clients appear to be positive and still pursuing things. We're still starting up new projects um, that are going you know going into entitlements, which is a good thing. That's you know that's going through the the planning approval process with you know the local jurisdiction and um, you know when you're doing when you're starting new projects, that's always reassuring. You know that that there's confidence out there, um, in the development community. And, um, so yeah, so far it, it feels pretty good. It feels like 2021 will, you know, be good. We, you know, we have made some adjustments. Um, you know, we, we did a, a few layoffs uh, at the beginning of the year just to kind of balance things out. You know, it's a tough thing you have to do. And, um, but you know, for the sake of the overall company and, you know, for longevity, you've got to do those kind of things sometimes. Yeah. Um, but you know, yeah, we're, we're feeling pretty good, feeling positive. We're, we're, holding our numbers and uh, holding the, you know, we have a really strong team now. We've um, over the last three years, you know, we have, like I said, we have recruited a lot of great people and we've put processes in place that are, um, you know, allowing us to be more efficient and the quality is raising. So it's, it's there's still, it's still a work in progress, but it's, uh, it's going in the right direction. That's all that I can 
asked for at this point. So brilliant. Yeah. Amazing. Paul, thank you so much for your yeah. time this morning. I can see the sun is fully up now. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where <laughs> you are. Um, and it has been a really fascinating, uh, insight into how you've grown form four and some of the things that make the business successful so thank you very much yeah well thanks for having me great and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfillment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information if you enjoyed today's show please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.